Hi, everyone, and welcome. This is Amy Moyer with Action for Healthy Kids. Thanks so much for joining our session today, brought to you by the Gen Youth Foundation, National Dairy Council, and Action for Healthy Kids. On Healthy Kids equal kids ready to learn what you can do. We're really excited to present to you a lot of great information today. We have a great panel of speakers, which we'll introduce to you here in just a few minutes. So thanks for, again, your time. We plan on going for about an hour today. And the call is being recorded as well as uh, archived. So if you have um, a chance to just sit back and relax, please do so. You don't need to take notes frivolously. We will be providing to you the slide deck as well as the recording following today's session. So you can send it out and review it again if you'd like. Because there are so many uh, individuals participating on today's session, we do have all participants in muted only mode. So if you have a question at any point throughout today's session, feel free to enter it on the question box. You see it located here on your slide. Um, and, and we will take those questions there at the end of the session. As I mentioned again, and I'll repeat it throughout today's session, that this call is being recorded and slides will be sent out following today's call. So first up, just a quick overview of our agenda. Our focus today is really going to be looking at health and academic achievement and the research that supports it. Uh, we're going to learn from Alexis Glick, the CEO of the Gen Youth Foundation, who's going to overview some recent research that supports how nutrition and physical activity lead to academic success. We brought a principal on today's panel from Minnesota who's going to look at the success that he's seen in his school and is going to be able to give us his perspective on how student health and wellness helps him do his job more effectively. We're also going to hear from a parent out in Colorado on how she participated in helping get her school on a healthier path. She has a lot of great experience year, over years of work that she's put into helping her school um, feed healthier foods and providing more physically act physical activity opportunities to her students. So she's got a lot of great experience to offer to us. And then we'll finish up with identifying some high-level ideas on what your role can be in your school community and what kinds of projects you may want to undertake to, to get your school moving in the right direction. As I mentioned earlier, we will have a Q&A session at the end and make sure to answer questions that you may have about this particular work. Before we get started, I do want to uh, run a couple of polling questions. So give me just a couple of minutes to get those polling questions up. I'd like to find out a little bit more about who it is we're talking to today. Great, I'm going to give you just a couple of more seconds on this poll. Great, so as you can see, it looks like the vast majority of individuals that have joined us today are nonprofit professionals, followed closely, well, followed by about 9% of parents and community members, and then 7% of each of school administrators and school staff. So we have quite a diverse audience today, so thanks for joining us have one additional polling question for you before we get started. And that is, did you know that healthy eating and physical activity can lead to improved academic success? Give you just a couple of more seconds to answer that question.
Great, and it looks like the vast majority of our audience is very well aware that healthy eating and physical activity does improve academic success, and they're excited to learn more. So thanks for your participation in those polls. Uh, without further ado, I'm very excited about our panel, our panelist speakers today. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, and that is Alexis Glick. Alexis is the CEO of the Gen Youth Foundation. The Gen Youth Foundation is a nonprofit organization dedicated to nurturing child health and wellness through improved nutrition and physical activity. Gen Youth's flagship program, Fuel Up to Play 60, is a partnership between the National Football League and the National Dairy Council and empowers youth in more than 73,000 schools to improve their own health by consuming nutri nutrient-rich foods and achieving at least 60 minutes of physical activity daily. So Alexis, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to learn more about the latest research that supports health and academics. I'll now turn it over to you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Amy, and uh, thank you to our, our partners and friends and colleagues at Action for Healthy Kids, National Dairy Council, and of course, um, to um, wonderful, wonderful leaders in their communities, uh, Patrick and Nicole. So it is an honor to join you guys today. Just to step back for a moment, um, when you see the wellness impact and enhancing academic success through healthy school environments, as most of us on this phone know, our greatest national treasure is our children, and in particular, how we can provide an environment that really can embrace and empower their health and well-being. So we're going to talk a little bit today about that connection between nutrition, physical activity, and learning, and why it is so integral to build a framework for a healthy school environment to promote health through things like participation in breakfast, not just because of childhood obesity, but equally as much because of malnutrition and hunger, and to talk about that inextricable link between physical activity and nutrition and its impact on learning, and where do we stand in the science, the research, the awareness, and how we can utilize some of the information that the partners on this call have put together to help elevate this science, including something that we call the Wellness Impact Report. In our case, for Gen Youth, it all started with the Nutrition Plus Physical Activity Learning Connection Summit in the summer of 2012 when, as you can see, Dr. David Satcher, the former Surgeon General, was the chair of this, what we would consider groundbreaking convening of leaders in nutrition, science, education, academia, to really look at where the science of the learning connection was at that time, almost two years ago. And so we hosted this summit with our partners at the National Dairy Council, American College of Sports Medicine, and the American School Health Association to coalesce and bring leaders both at the national and the local level together to look at the impact that nutrition and physical activity had on academic success. And our purpose was really to elevate the science, build awareness, and then build stakeholders holder engagement at the local level that could help support that connection and help build and drive deepening awareness among parents, teachers, educators, and even students, yes, students who we at Gen Youth believe are our greatest champions. And so we often say that um, the one we want to uplift most is the students and to empower them to really advance their own health and solutions. And so we embarked on this first foray into the science behind the um, connection between nutrition and physical activity, which has led to, if you look at on the next slide, the wellness impact report as well as the infographic, as you can see on the right. And I call out these two tools in particular because the wellness impact, as you can see, enhancing academic success to healthy school environments, took all the science and research and analysis that came together as a result of the summit and put it into both one location where we could share our learnings, but also where we could provide resources and tools and executive summaries for both educators, parents, administrators, students, so that we could really help enable folks at the national and the local level to move the dialogue forward. And what this this piece does, what the wellness impact really does, is it substantiates that inextricable link between physical activity, healthy eating, and the impact on 
the health and well-being and this risk of things like chronic diseases. And, oh, by the way, a child's readiness to learn. How could increased activity and participation in something as simple as breakfast that we take for granted, how could that have an impact on a child's academic achievement on standardized tests and math and English, among other uh, key subjects. So we really did it to increase awareness and to really, um, to really build support for the notion that the first thing in schools and municipalities that should not get cut from budgets these days is access to physical activity and healthy foods. And if you look at the next slide, we often in this space talk a lot about overweight and obesity and the percentage of kids in this country who are overweight and obese. But we never want to forget the fact that there is an even more dire situation, and that's sometimes that you may have a child who is hungry but obese or a child who is malnourished. And today we have over 22% of our children who are living in homes with insufficient food. And if you look at the traditional school building, in one school building, lunch is being served at 10 a.m. And in another school building, lunch is being served at 2 p.m. But if we're not making sure that a child has a healthy breakfast or a healthy snack for a kid who's eating lunch at 2 p.m., and that lunch equates to 50% of their average daily caloric intake, we are setting our kids up for failure. So. We thought, and I think rightly so, that yes, we understand there's an enormous amount of focus on overweight and obesity, but we cannot ignore those kids who are malnourished, food insecure, or who may be hungry but obese. A lot of folks wonder how, in fact, does food insecurity affect academic performance. And as you can imagine, when, when, when anyone is hungry, a kid, an adult, uh, and they have inconsistent access to food, they have difficulty concentrating. You know, imagine you as an adult, uh, what it takes to, uh, to, to really concentrate when those neurons are firing off. And oftentimes it's when you're physically active or when you take a break to rush out and get a quick snack to fuel up and recharge your body. And so schools, you know, are, are, are making a real conservative effort across the country, and we being one of the biggest advocates, as well as the National Dairy Council and Action for Healthy Kids, to help make sure that the average daily participation rate in things like breakfast are available, because they do have direct implications on things like standardized testing, um, academic performance, both in, in math, in reading, uh, you name it. But the critical issue is that we can't forget that there is something called food insecurity. And critical calories are being consumed in the school building 180 days of school year, including in school feeding programs. And, and we know for a fact that children who go hungry in kindergarten are noticeably behind their peers in reading and math by as early as third grade. They suffer, suffer from hyperactivity, absenteeism, and, and socially and academically, they fall behind. So they're more than likely to need assistance. So we know today that these are critical paths that we need to address right away in order to ensure that we're creating an environment for these kids to be healthy, high-achieving students. When I speak specifically about breakfast and the benefits of breakfast, you know, there's solid research. In fact, there's a lot of research in that wellness impact report that documents the benefits of breakfast to a child. Um, but a breakfast that oftentimes isn't mentioned is a positive effect on your overall nutrient intake. And in fact, there's research that shows the students who eat breakfast have higher consumption of the key nutrients that, that, that breakfast skippers miss. Um, and that they, you know, unfortunately, they don't tend to make up for those missed nutrients in lunch or through snacking. So that breakfast, while we all often say is the most critically important meal, skipping it is really the most detrimental thing we can do for our kids. And, and in fact, even among adequately nourished children, the diet can impact learning disabilities both positively and negatively. And, and if you look at the statistics, over half of all teens do not eat breakfast each day. 
they are skipping breakfast. So if we know that there's a positive consequence of breakfast on performance and they're skipping, we know we're not equipping them with the resources that they need in order to be successful. One could argue the same is true for physical activity. And um, I, I bring up this slide because uh, Dr. Chuck, Chuck Hillman at the University of Illinois was one of our key presenters at our Learning Connection Summit in 2012. And as you can see in this slide here, he studied a, a child sedentary versus a child that was walking for 20 minutes to see what is the impact, as you can see in this brain scan, on what they call the hippocampus. And you'll see from this, this is the visual evidence of the neuro, what they call the neurophysiological impact of physical activity. And if you look at the two brain scans of children taking tests, the kid on the left, that child was sitting quietly before taking the test, but the child on the right, that child walked for 20 minutes before taking the test. And what you want is a more active brain to get the engine revving up. And that's demonstrated in the yellow and red coloring on your right. And so you can see that the kid on the right is equipped to perform better just from something as simple as walking for 20 minutes. So we would consider this, you know, I, I, no pun intended, but a no-brainer. It's a win-win-win. So we need to make sure that when we're factoring all those equations into what makes a kid a healthy learner, that we're fueling them and that we're also giving them the opportunity to be active, not just before, during, and after the school day, but oftentimes for in-class breaks, among other things. As I move forward here, you know, when we talk a little bit about resources and tools, I just want to point out um, in the Nutrition Today article uh, not too long ago, we want to let you know about this article in the January, February issue, and it highlights some of the learnings of the 2012 Learning Connection Summit from some of the most renowned leaders and doctors in this field. And I, I, I do you know, encourage you to take advantage of this research because we assume that people know this connection, but I can tell you firsthand as a mother, a parent, only new to this effort in the past three years, I was not aware of the learning connection. And I find that in my efforts and communications as I travel across the country, there are many who are still not aware of it. If I could fast forward for a moment to the learning connection and the work that we have done over the past two years around the learning connection, we have hosted town halls at this stage in five cities. We have three more planned in Indiana, Indianapolis, I'm sorry, in South Bend, uh, Indianapolis and St. Louis, and, and some more in the works. But we intend to culminate in a nutrition plus physical activity secondary summit where we're going to bring in our student ambassadors for Fuel to Play 60 across the country and we convene to see how much progress have we made in the two years since we began talking about this dialogue. This summit is going to be in July um, in Dallas at AT&T Stadium. In mid-July, the thought leader piece of it will be on July 16th. So I call your attention to that because we will be following up and we would love to have folks join us to learn more about it, what can be done today, and what has been done thus far. And just finally, um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, call attention to the thing I'm ultimately most proud of, and that is this spectacular program called Fuel Up to Play 60. And, um, and for those who do know about it, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled for those who don't know about it. It is a program that was co-founded by the National Dairy Council and the National Football League in collaboration with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And it really encourages students to take charge in making small, simple, everyday changes toward creating a healthy lifestyle. Everything about it is fun and fundamental. It's fun for kids. It's about empowering the student voice. It's about giving schools the grants and resources that they need to be successful. And so as Amy spoke about in the beginning, we are in 73,000 schools. We are reaching 38 million kids a day. But if it were not for the adult champions, both inside the school building and out, this program would never have been as successful as it is today. So with that, it is my great honor and pleasure to turn the, the, uh, the podium over to a good friend, Patrick Smith. He is 
uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful champion of You Love to Play 60. He has taught third and fourth grade for seven years. He spent four years as an instructional assistant. Six, if this is his sixth year as an elementary principal, his second specifically uh, at Bathwood Elementary, Maple Grove, Minnesota. He has been implementing Fuel Up to Play 60 in several schools for upwards of four years now, and he has coached wrestling and soccer and, um, and at high school levels for years. He has been a great champion of one of our most wonderful student ambassadors, Josh Miller. And so it is an honor to turn it over to Patrick to talk a little bit about what he has been doing in the school building and in community to in, enrich so many lives. Patrick? All right. Thank you, Alexis. Well, to follow that, I don't know, that's such an awesome presentation. And I had the pleasure of spending a couple of days with Alexis uh, down in Omaha after Josh Miller, one of my current sixth grade students, had won the first Gen Youth Grant. Um, for his uh, idea of Motivational Mondays, which we are um, very excited about and have been implementing, implementing this year throughout the year. So thank you, Alexis. Again, it's great to hear back from you, and, and I got some great uh, information from you that I can continue to use here at Basswood Elementary. Um, as you can see on the slide here, um, this is our school demographics. We are a l very large elementary school, uh, the largest in our school district of, of over 1,100 students uh, and growing. Uh, we have over 120 licensed staff and non-licensed staff. We're the home of the Bulldogs. Uh, we do have a low percentage of free and reduced lunch. However, 11% of over 1,100 kids is a, still a lot of students, um, and also 24% 24, 24 students of color. So a very enriching school. Um, we also speak about 47 different languages throughout our school, which is a phenomenal resource we have uh, with our community and our families. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, I'd like to really highlight the backbone of our Fuel Up to Play 60 program here at Basswood, which has uh, grown uh, quite considerably over the last two years. Uh, we are now over 40 student ambassadors in our building here. Uh, we do have an application process. Uh, last year we had about 20 students, and they all filled out applications. We probably had about, I'd say, between three and 400 students apply. Um, and we narrowed that down to 20 student leaders last year. And, and this year, for the application process, again, we had about the same number of applicants. And that student body of 20 from last year read through the applications as a team, narrowed it down to their top two or three from each classroom. And then uh, the adult uh, Field to Play 60 uh, representatives looked at those finalists and made some decisions as um, identifying the top leaders in each classroom. And I should back up a little bit. Uh, we have student representation from grades three through six. We are a K-6 building. So we did add third grade this year, which made our team much bigger. Uh, we do meet once a month. Um, I do have a FIAD teacher, myself, and then one of our uh, educational support professionals as our advisors, Field to Play 60 advisors, and we lead those student meetings monthly. Um, and one of the things that we do, um, obviously between the two things of promoting nutrition and physical activity, with uh, promoting good nutrition, our students really lead this. And, and as Alexis mentioned in her talk, uh, our students are our greatest champions. And they, the, they are the ones that move this work. And through the promoting good nutrition, some things that we've done, uh, we've painted uh, through access to grant money from Field Play 60 and uh, Midwest Dairy Council. Uh, we did Paint Goes a Long Way and we were able to really spruce up our lunchroom to promote uh, making healthy choices. Uh, daily we have a BWTV broadcast that, uh, that has announcements. Our fifth graders are on TV and, and making announcements for the day, and we incorporate uh, uh, promoting good nutrition through that source. We have an information station, which we also purchased through the grant that we received this year, and that is uh, the ability for us to talk about upcoming Motivational Monday ideas, um, talk about the uh, food nutrition that the students have for breakfast and for lunch, uh, for the menus that are coming up, and then also to promote our challenges for the upcoming month. And then we also get our staff involved. Uh, they all made, each grade level made their own posters. Uh, our fifth grade team is displayed on this slide as Got Veggies, and this is all based off of the Got Milk uh, campaign that we've all seen. Uh, so that's promoting good nutrition, and we do a variety of things um, throughout the year to continue to promote that. Uh, through the physical activity piece, again, I mentioned Motivational Mondays. 
Josh Miller, just an outstanding student. I uh, would not be surprised if you see him as one of our future presidents of the United States. States. Uh, he has declared that, uh, so I don't know if that will be the 56th, 57th one, but he's a go-getter and he's an outstanding child and, and what a great student to have as really the leader to get to feel to play, play 60 up and running in our school. So he leads the Motivational Mondays. He has created his own student uh, subgroups to take charge in different areas of Motivational Mondays. So he is quite the leader there. I have not had to do a thing. Um, again, our, what, students are our greatest champions and they're the ones that make the program successful. Uh, we do, uh, as a team, student team, we create school-wide challenges, uh, which uh, we do different physical activity challenges along with the nutrition piece, and then we promote that through our various venues and get kids excited about moving and making good choices. Uh, classroom activity breaks daily. You could walk in any room at any given moment, and you're probably going to find some sort of activity break that occurs. Uh, anywhere from our kindergartners doing yoga to uh, doing dance videos, and our kids love the YouTube versions of Just Dance, and they, they have the latest songs, and they're up there dancing in the classroom, and, and I'm, I'm seeing classrooms that are doing these activity dance breaks that you would never guess would have done it. So it's, it's pretty exciting to see all the movement that happens. Uh, and then they sit down, and they transition to something else, and as you saw with Alexis's slide with the brain activity, um, that is the benefit that they get as they move into the next lesson. Why do we do Fuel Up to Play 60 at Basswood? Well, we believe that physical, physical activity and making healthy choices positively impacts student learning, helping students to be successful in school and in life. Um, I'm all about putting kids in the place to where they can gain and learn uh, so that we can prepare them for life outside of school. And so this, we have a huge opportunity here with our young students to create positive habits um, in how they make healthy choices nutritionally nutrition-wise and then also physical-wise. Um, I see it every day. I see the energy that kids get from taking these physical activity breaks. I see the focus that they um, are in, in their learning when I walk in throughout all my walkthroughs and see the classes interacting with each other. Uh, the positive attitudes that come from the breaks and from having a good breakfast and being ready to learn is just incredible. Uh, and then the, the brain stimulation, as you saw, the research shows that you get those the brains uh, the students moving, that stimulation is only going to benefit their learning. So very excited. I see it on a daily basis, and our test scores uh, are, are, are fairly high as a, as a whole school, uh, but it's just about that engagement that I see on a daily basis in the classroom based on, um, you know, one of the pieces is with the physical activity and, and making healthy choices. So that's why we do it. It's, it's good for kids. And it's good for um, what we call, it, we call our students lifelong learners. And this is something I want them to take away with them as they move through K-12 system into college and in life. Uh, students are the, are the champions. They lead this. But there is so many reasons why we have to reach out and want to reach out to a variety of groups. Uh, number one in the middle here you see um, kind of my adult team. I have a sixth grade teacher, a phi ed teacher. Um, and an educational support professional, um, along with the Viking player in the middle there. And uh, this is our team. Well, the Viking player isn't, but uh, the rest of, this, rest of the adults are. And then we also have some other key adults in the building, teachers who meet on a probably every other month basis to help lead some of our, um, our initiatives with uh, challenges and, and really getting information out to kids. Our students are, again, like I said, our key champions. They're the ones that make this program successful. They're the ones that lead and come up with the ideas. I'm really student driven. I, I don't want to put all the ideas in their heads. I want them to work together to come up with uh, what they believe our whole school community can get involved in. And then we're now starting to really start get a, getting our parents and our community members involved more into our program. Um, I believe in opening our walls, bringing in as many community members, family, uh, anybody into our school so that uh, our students can benefit from the knowledge and expertise of a wide range of individuals that could um, help with this program. So that's, that's really what our program is about. Uh, we continue to grow. Um, I see a huge difference in the community within our building of a large building. Uh, it really brings us together as a family and this is something that I will continue to lead no matter where I go uh, in the future. Uh, Amy, I believe that's all I have. I'll pass it back to you.
Great. Thank you so much, Patrick. You're certainly an inspiration, obviously a strong leader. You've now done this work in two different schools, so congratulations to you. It's so, uh, it's so great to hear that you're being recognized on the national level as well as making such tremendous successes locally and inspiring your youth. So congrats to you and thank you for your expertise. I'm going to now turn a little bit to uh, the parent role and have Nicole Croy speak about her experience in Ryan Elementary in Westminster, Colorado. Nicole is a, Nicole is a mother of a first grader and a fourth grader at Ryan Elementary. She's a parent representative on the school's wellness committee. She serves as the co-program advisor for Feel Up to Play 60 and is also the PTA president. So she's very engaged in her school environment and is definitely a parent champion. She's been involved with Action for Healthy Kids now for the last several years as well. So we are very lucky to have Nicole inspiring her community as well as some additional work on the national level. So Nicole, let's hear your perspective. Thank you, Amy. Um, and I just quickly want to compliment Patrick and all of his great efforts at Basswood. Um, it's really great to hear of another school having success as well with the Field to Play 60 program. So as Amy said, I am a parent at Ryan Elementary. Um, we're a K through 6 elementary school in the Jefferson County Public School District. We have 524 students with about a 26.4% free and reduced rate. So to give a little backstory on myself, um, my journey as a parent advocate for school wellness really started when my oldest, who is now a fourth grader, started kindergarten at Ryan. Um, I was completely green to the school climate. And I started out volunteering to be a parent for his, a room parent for his class. And needless to say, I was left in a state of shock after our first fall party of the year. Um, there was not a single nutritious food item available at the party, and soda was the only beverage option. There were so many sweets that each child could have had three cupcakes and three cookies each. Uh, after that party, I was a little shaken up and quickly found out that there were currently no guidelines or restrictions on what type of food could be shared at the school. In addition to the party food problem, my son's teacher had a practice of awarding Skittles or a sucker for good behavior. I felt like every day he was coming home with candy or a cupcake in celebration of a classmate's birthday or a job well done. Not only was the excessive sugary treats a concern, I also learned that recess and time for physical activity was very limited. PE class is on a class rotation, which means a student goes six days before they get to PE. The compounding all of this, um, it prompted me to attend my first PTA meeting. I felt like this was going to be my avenue as a parent to start voicing my concerns. Needless to say, my concerns were not well received initially. Um, the current PTA members were not at all interested in health and wellness. And while I left the meeting a bit discouraged, I actually spoke to the principal after the meeting. And through chance, she had received an email from Action for Healthy Kids about a roundtable specifically for parents. So I ended up attending the event, which I believe was transformational. Um, I discovered there was this large movement of parents working to address the exact same concerns that I was observing in my child's school. It was really the catalyst for me to get things going at Ryan. But I have to do full disclosure at this point and note that I am now the president of Ryan PTA, all because I wanted to see healthy changes. So I caution those to be careful what you wish for and what you get involved in. Um, almost four years later now at Ryan, in addition to a supportive PTA, we have a strong school wellness team that I serve as the parent rep. I was also able to um, get the Field to Play 60 program going at the school, and this has really been the foundation of our efforts. We're now in our fourth school year as an active participant of the program, and I serve as the co-program advisor with our amazing PE teacher. We've really used the Field to Play 60 program as an overarching platform for all of our wellness efforts. The way that Field to Play 60 is designed with building your team, involving the student voice, 
and working on one specific nutrition and physical activity play each year, it keeps our efforts focused and manageable. And then with the attraction of the Denver Broncos, it's really sparked the kids' excitement for our healthy efforts. I would say that most importantly, the core of the program, working as a team, and this is why I believe we've been so successful at Ryan. We have the school principal, teachers, parents, and students all working towards the common goal. The most significant project um, that I would say we've completed at Ryan was the remodel of our cafeteria. With grant money from Field to Play 60, we refreshed the dull, plain cafeteria into a bright, inviting, healthy Hawks Cafe. The cafe includes messaging on nutrition and reminds the importance of being physically active through artwork that the student team created. Our student team, as well as parents and teacher volunteers, helped to complete the work. And the impact of this project has been deep-rooted now into our entire school culture. It serves as like a daily visual reminder that our school is a place for healthy living. Another impactful change our wellness team has made is our healthy foods policy. We have what is called the 80-20 food policy for all shared foods at school. The policy, which was one of our goals in our school improvement plan a couple years ago, states that 80% of the food being shared in classes must be of nutritious offerings. While 20% can be the cookies, the cupcakes, the candy, etc., it's all about balancing the offerings. We've had a really great response, and parents have even gotten a little competitive, as you can see from some of the pictures, with bringing in creative, healthy food art. And I'd say the best part of this policy is that the students have not even noticed the lack of the excess of sugary treats. It's actually become more exciting for them to see what sort of vegetable tray is going to come in for Halloween this year. Uh, at the core of our healthy school is our Healthy Hawks High Five. This is a healthy take on the school's already existent positive behavior support program. So students receive a high five slip if they're observed or caught eating healthy foods, being active at recess, walking or biking to school, keeping clean by washing hands, or being safe. After the parent, the student takes the slip of paper home, their parent signs off on it, then the student returns the slip to a collection bu bucket, and each week winners are drawn to receive prizes. Um, prizes range from an extra Friday recess, fuel up to play 60 merchandise, and even cooking classes with Whole Foods chefs. Finally, our most recent wellness project was creating indoor recess kits and implementing brain breaks throughout the school day. As you can imagine, in Colorado, we have a lot of indoor recess days due to snow. Before creating the activity kits, indoor recesses usually consisted of kids sitting and watching a movie. The wellness team, with recommendations from our Field to Play 60 student team, created the kits that are simple, student-directed movement activities that can be, take place in a small area. So teachers aren't having to move desks and completely shift their classrooms around to accommodate. They're simple, but fun, and the kids have really responded to them. Also using grant money, um, we purchased a site-wide license for the brain, a brain break company called Go Noodle, um, and now our kids participate in brain breaks throughout the day. Um, most recently, last year we had students participate in a brain break prior to taking the standardized test. Um, so Speaking of testing, you can see that um, based on the standardized testing, greatschools.org ranks, ranks Ryan a 9 out of 10, which is above average. And only 24% of the schools in Colorado rank above average. Most notably, our student growth rate, we received a 10 out of 10 this year, which is really exciting. So looking deeper into our standardized testing, um, Ryan substantially outperforms the averages across the state. We can switch to the next slide. This is a sampling from last year's um, standardized testing results, our fourth graders. And as you can see, Ryan fourth graders averaged 94% in math, whereas the state averaged 72%.
in reading, Ryan fourth grader scored 88%, whereas the state average was 68%. And in writing, our fourth graders scored 74%, whereas the state average was 53%. In addition to scoring above the state average, substantial growth was recorded the last two years. This is fifth graders um, between 2012 and 2013 at Ryan. They recorded a 10% increase in growth in writing between the two years, going from a 75 to an 85%. Uh, notable growth was also seen in reading and science. I think this data is particularly interesting when you correlate it to the implementation and building of our school wellness projects that we've been doing the last few years. The growth on the TCAP scores this year were so high that Ryan received the Governor's Distinguished Improvement Award for the first time in the school's history. I think it's very exciting and validating for the work that's being done, not just in the wellness of the school, but the whole, in, the whole school environment. And I realize that standardized testing is only one aspect of the school, but since implementing our wellness projects, teachers have also noted better behavior, less need for classroom management due to poor behavior, better transitions between subjects, more attentive students, all which equates to better prepared students, increased learning opportunities, and ultimately smarter kids. So to conclude, I hope I've provided some inspiration for you to take action to create healthier school environments in your own schools. I will say that the positive impacts that we're experiencing at Ryan are the result of persistence over several years. We've experienced roadblocks, and we've met resistance to change along the way. And it was only through the solid support of a team of teachers, principals, students, and parents that we were able to reach our goal. So now I'd like to turn it back over to Amy with Action for Healthy Kids. Thanks so much, Nicole. I definitely think you have inspired others. I know you certainly inspired me. You're just a, a great advocate and champion in your own community. So congrats to you for all your efforts. And it's actually a good segue, as you mentioned in your uh, section about how the importance of your team was in helping you accomplish your goals. That's really what I want to focus on during my section. What is your role and really what, why do we want to continue down this path? Alexis alluded to this during her section. I'm also going to reiterate it here again because what we're looking at here is health disparity. It, it leads to education disparities, which you can see here on this slide. I'll just read it because it's so critical to understand. Kids who don't eat nutritiously and don't have the opportunities to enjoy regular physical activity may be at an academic disadvantage. So when it comes to making sure your kids have everything they need, to be successful in school, health, nutrition, and physical activity are definitely part of the equation as all the research shows. And as Patrick and Nicole and Alexis have all talked through today, we all have a role to play. At Action for the Kids, we are a national nonprofit that works with state teams throughout the country, and our focus is to really help schools make sure they've got nutrition and physical activity at the forefront of their student health plans. Again, not to just fight childhood obesity, that's certainly part of it, but also to help them be ready for learning. We do this through a three-phase or three-pronged model. The first is helping individuals learn about the issue and potential solutions. So you've learned about all the different data and research that supports health and academics from Alexis. You've learned about various solutions from Patrick and Nicole today about how you can take specific actions. And hopefully, you'll go home to your school and start to take actions. Really build the school health teams, build your school health plans at your individual school building level, and take those specific actions to eventually where you can transform your school and really, like Nicole and Patrick, make sure that health is part of the everyday culture. It's not just a one-off program in one classroom or in the cafeteria. It's really seen throughout the entire school day about the entire school environment, from athletic events after school, to classroom parties, to recess, and even before school breakfast and walking programs. That's really the goal, is to transform school environments so kids have the opportunities to practice healthy eating and being physically active over the course of the day. So let's talk about some examples of other educators and parents that have really made a difference. 
educators, what's your role? You know, as Patrick said, as a principal of his school and as a previous teacher in other schools, he found his role to be big. He had an opportunity to really impact change. Here are other examples. Sam Kelly and Sam Teal, the principal and school nurse at Hodge Elementary in Denton, Texas. They identified a problem. It was a big problem, but it was a single problem where students were starting the school day without breakfast. And as Alexis talks through the data, really indicates that without that breakfast, students cannot function and focus in the classroom. So they saw this as an opportunity to improve student health, behavior issues, and academic success. You ask any school nurse when students come to their office over the course of the school day, many of them will tell you it's visits early in the morning because kids are hungry, their tummies are upset. And a lot of school nurses will tell you they have a snack drawer ready and available for that. A school breakfast program, though, can be a solution to that. So Sam and Sam started a universal breakfast program in the classroom uh, that really made a significant impact in their school. Um, Changing the Steam was also a program, and Hodge Healthy Family Challenge was uh, an additional effort that Sam and Sam have since started because their universal breakfast program was so successful. They saw immediate impact, and teachers, uh, at first resistant, really felt that it helped their students settle into their school day and begin more focused and more ready. Another teacher, a kindergarten teacher in Northport Elementary in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, she really saw in the morning that student, or in the afternoon that after long stretches of academic work, even if the school had recess, there were behavior issues. Kids were starting to wiggle. They were starting to poke at each other. They were starting to really get unfocused. So she, she suggested to her principal that they consider a brain break. And both Patrick and Nicole did mention brain breaks as an option. They've implemented it now across the kindergarten grade levels and have really seen an immediate success. Uh, brain breaks, if you aren't familiar with them, they can connect to academic concepts. You're counting by twos, by fives. You're learning about science as you're moving. So it's definitely an academic um, activity that includes physical activity. And what, could you, what you can see here from Carla Jones, who's a kindergarten teacher at Northport, is that brain breaks have helped my children be more attentive during whole group instruction. Now their minds are clear, the wiggles are out, and they are ready to learn. Brain breaks are five to 10 minutes a day and can really, as you can see, make a significant difference in helping teachers accomplish their job more effectively. Parents and community members, as Nicole indicated, have a huge role. And Patrick talked about the need to have parents and community members on their team, too. Parents have a voice, a very strong voice, in the school system and can oftentimes fill gaps where schools may be lacking in human resources. So in addition to Nicole's story, there are hundreds of thousands of parents across the country that are putting forth effort in helping schools become healthier places. Here's another example from Amy McChesney in Lamar Elementary in Austin, Texas. She looked at her playground, and there was a lot of empty space. And her passion is school garden. So she really wanted to help students understand where their foods were coming from, what cabbage looks like, what carrots look like, what potatoes look like. They're not always mashed. They're not always cubed or diced or sliced or in chip form, what the actual potato looks like as it's growing. So she worked with school staff to build a garden using both parents and student volunteers and was really able to rally her community around the school garden. So much so that teachers now utilize it as a learning opportunity. It's nutrition education. Each day, a different classroom goes out, looks at the produce, weeds if necessary, and harvests some of the produce. They've been able to use that produce and taste test opportunities and in some cases have been able to help change their school menu based on some of the favorites that students found in their garden. So I think this is just some examples of what your role can be in uh, helping to change the school health landscape. I'm going to quickly go through some additional ideas. We've heard so many from Nicole and Patrick. As you can see here, there are many others that focus on nutrition education and promotion. We've mentioned taste tests. Health fairs are also extremely successful and can really help you get the support from community members in helping make sure that the healthy messages 
get the home environment as well. After school cooking classes are phenomenal resources for students to help them get interested in not only how food is grown in the garden, but how it's produced and ends up on your table. Nutrition guidelines. Um, we've heard a little bit today about the new school meals rules and how that impacts fruits and vegetables, dairy products, and whole grains in our lunch programs and breakfast programs. There are also other opportunities to set nutrition guidelines. The 80-20 rule that Nicole talked about is a great idea, really looking at snacks, celebrations, rewards that may be given to students for um, report cards or otherwise, they can make a significant difference. It doesn't always have to be uh, a, food, a sweet treat. It can be a healthy food item or even a physical activity reward to reinforce the messages we're trying to uh, um, engage students in. Physical activity and physical education. Some of the more simple ideas for increasing activity include walking school buses which is literally where students meet on a corner in the morning and walk to school with a group of individuals and an adult leader. Active recess, where students aren't just hanging out by the tiring or sitting around in circles, but you're getting them up, getting them engaged, and giving them a little bit of structured play. Nicole talked about, and you can see the picture here, is indoor recess, getting the students up during indoor recess so they're burning calories and otherwise re-energizing their brains. And of course, the cornerstone of any physical activity program is physical education. So really working with your district to get physical education in your schools as much as you can, ideally every day, but every, every day that you can offer it is definitely a move in the right direction. And then finally, health promotion. A recess before lunch, a very simple concept. It's just what it is. Can you offer recess before the students have lunch? Get their wiggles out. They're not rushed during lunch to scarf down their food to get to the playground. Instead, they're at, their, at the playground. They're playing hard. They're getting all their wiggles out. They come in and are able to sit and focus on their lunch. They consume more of the healthy food items since they're not in such a rush to get to the playground. And teachers say that they make a much smoother transition back into the classroom. There aren't, so many, there aren't as many behavior issues um, with recess before lunch. It takes some scheduling. Um, it can add some complexity to scheduling, but it's definitely a program you may want to consider. TV Turn Off Week is another great campaign to really help engage the community in unplugging for just a week and start to identify other resources in your community that can keep you physically active. We mentioned today a couple of different reports that could be valuable to you as you make your progress in your community. The first is the Learning Connection Report. It's really geared towards parents in particular as you work on understanding the data, the research that Alexis uh, talked much about. This report is really geared towards you. It helps you boil down the research. It helps give you some talking points as you're working with your school and your administrators. You can see the link to access that report at the bottom. The Wellness Impact Report is also for a, a wide variety of audience members. It really dives into a lot of different research that's out there. It's an, it's an excellent report that um, really helps you understand not just the research, but what roles you can play as well. So that is also on, available online, both of which are free. And then lastly, financial resources. You'll be surprised to learn that some of the activities that we've talked about today don't cost a significant amount of money. But sometimes they do require some startup grants or startup dollars. So there are two opportunities that we want to present to you today uh, of grants that you can apply for. Both of them are for next school year. So as you start planning for the 14-15 school year, definitely keep these grants in mind. Action for Healthy Kids is offering breakfast and physical activity grants. The, op the opportunities are open right now and are due the first part of May. So go to our website, actionforhealthykids.org to learn more. And then a little bit later this year in April, Feel Up to Play 60 is going to open their grant application to support healthy eating and physical activity play. So a lot of the, the activities that both Nicole and Patrick talk through can be funded. You can get up to 4,000 per school per year. The deadline again for that is June 4th and it will be available in April on the feelup to play 60.com website. 
So two great financial resources to really help your team either get started or keep the momentum going. So you're going to have to excuse me. As you could tell, I had a little bit of technical difficulty at the beginning. I'm going to have to bounce off the slides and get to our question panel. Now is a great time to ask any questions that you might have. Uh, we'd love to hear from you about questions you may have for our panel speakers. And in the interim, I'm going to ask Patrick a question. If all panel speakers could unmute your phones at this point. Patrick, I'm going to ask you a question. What are your biggest challenges as a principal to improving nutrition and opportunities for both breakfast and physical activity specifically? I would say one of the, the biggest challenges um, which is getting easier as you learn about as I learn about new grants is is really the budget and logistics um, for a large building so we've been exploring ways to really beef up our nutrition piece of our program and when you're talking 1100 students and you know breakfast we right now serve about eh, 60 to 80 closer to 60 students for breakfast each morning which is obviously very easy to do uh, but as we try to extend our breakfast program for such a large building that is really the biggest challenge um, but I'm the type of person that doesn't I don't believe that uh, we can't do something I know we can so it's just exactly what that is and, and so we're exploring some ideas of how we can uh, with motivational Mondays and how we can promote some healthy breakfast and, and get some things going there um, that that's has been our biggest challenge but we're making some headway with it uh, so really it's around just being a, such a large building and servicing so many students. Um, around physical activity, you know, we're fortunate or fairly fortunate in our district to where we have, we have a six-day cycle. So all of our students have physical education every other day um, over a six-day cycle. So three days of, of physical education, three days of music. Um, I would love to see an opportunity to turn that into an everyday um, opportunity for, for physical education. Uh, but again, the logistics and the large building and the staffing that we get and the space, uh, we definitely have a space issue here. Um, that, that's where the challenges come in. Uh, I, think, I think I answered everything there. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. That's really helpful. Alexis, I have a question for you. You talked about during your session, during your, during your section, excuse me, that uh, when you were first in, involved in this issue, you weren't aware of the learning connection issue. And as you travel across the country, you become more aware of how little information is out there about the public. So my question to you is, who are these stakeholders that we really need to get on board more urgently with the Learning Connection message? And what have you found to be the best way to do that? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question, um, Amy. I, I mean, I think the most critical stakeholder that we could really engage and make aware of this is, is the parent. I think you'll find that in the school environment, many educators, um, superintendents, PE teachers, nutrition directors, um, are increasingly, if not well aware, of the importance of, of being physically active and eating healthy and, and how that directly impacts attendance, behavior, performance, among other things. I think parents like me, um, you know, so many of us come from dual working uh, income households. You know, we're running from here to there, and sometimes we don't take the time to ask our kids, you know, what did you eat today or how many days a week you know, are you going to PE or did you have recess? And, and so I think sometimes it's, um, it's not because we don't deeply care, it's just that we have so much to manage, just like any teacher or professional, that, um, that if they were equipped, you'd have more moms like Nicole who could really help change the environment and who could really be that out spoken community member that could drive change inside the school building. I think the, the other thing I'd say is, you know, students are our greatest champions and they are the ones who really lead change. And in our experience, we have brought together some of the top national leaders uh, and local leaders in, in states across this country. And what we do systematically is we have students like Josh Miller, who uh, goes to Patrick's school sit in the center of those conversations. We just hosted a town hall in New York yesterday with about 50 different leaders. We had five students in the room, and when the students speak, everyone listens. So as much as we can do to enable students with bite-sized, digestible pieces of information that can equip them
student body to understand the importance of the things that we're trying to advocate for and why they're critical to learning is, um, is, is I think, one of the biggest steps we can make. So I think I'd prioritize parents and students, and then at the end of the day, everything is about the public-private partnership, and we have to work together. It cannot just be the public sector. It has to be a combination of the private sector as well, because these kids are the future workforce, they're the future military, you name it. Thank you. And speaking of parents, I want to hear from our panel parent one more time, kind of going from the other way. Nicole, you had the message. You wanted to make changes in your school. Who were the right people in your school? You said you talked about, you focused on the PTA, but who else that really gave you the traction you needed to make a difference? Yeah, um, I'd say our teachers. Um, when we looked into implementing the brain breaks in the classroom, one of the classroom teachers on our wellness team had said, you know, we need to empower the teachers to use this tool. We don't want to go in and say it's something that we're forcing them to do. It's another thing that they have to do. And so our PE teacher put together just a really great presentation on a lot of what Alexis talked about at the beginning of this webinar, just how it's going to affect their brain. It's going to affect their behavior. And so I think once our teaching staff kind of saw that, hey, this is important, and they made that learning connection. Um, they were very much on board with um, implementing. And I, I think, you know, the PTA was a place to start, but just talking to other parents. You know, you're standing around at pickup waiting for the kids to come out and just mentioning, hey, did you know that we're on a rotation so kids don't get PE every single day. They have to wait six days before they get PE. Or were you aware that they're only getting 20 minutes of recess time a day? Um, so just making connections. And I, I think for me, it's, I want people to understand the why and the impact. It's not a matter of, you know, we don't want kids eating sugar just because I don't personally like sugar. I don't believe in that as a healthy diet. It's about the research and the effects that that has. And so just empowering people to understand. And then our students, um, our student team has been amazing. Um, we got the idea for the cafeteria after the first meeting of our student leadership team with the Field to Play 60 group. Um, we said, you know, where do you see change? Where do you think the changes need to happen in the school? And the kids said, the cafeteria. And one kid said, it's like being in prison. And then once you walk in there and see the dull white walls, you understand why. And why would you want to go in this environment and make healthy choices? So I think it's just a real team effort. And you have to reach out to everyone involved and show them the importance and how there's going to be payoff with that. Great. Thank you, Nicole, Patrick, and Alexis. We really appreciate your expertise today on today's session. Uh, we are at the top of our hour, so I just want to remind everyone that this call was recorded. We mentioned several resources over the course of the session, the Wellness Impact Report, the Learning Connection Report, some school grants, and some additional ideas that you may consider. We will follow up with you via email and make sure you have access to all of that information, as well as the slides and today's recording. So stay tuned with, for that information. It will most likely go out tomorrow. Uh, we apologize for the technical glitches we experienced early on in the session, but hopefully you hung out with us and got a lot of valuable information. We thank you for joining us today and look forward to hearing about your successes as you have them in your community. Have a great afternoon.